Hey guys, it's lovely. So I'm uh, reading a new book, uh, Liberal Fascism by Jonah Goldberg. Um, I started it a few days ago, and uh, during this recording you might hear a lot of noise. Uh, we're moving things around at my old house. I have two houses. <laughs> but uh, we're moving things around because uh, they're going to fumigate, so you might hear a lot of noises. But... Uh, that shouldn't be much of an issue. So, I already started reading some of the chapter. I'm already on page 16. There's eight pages left until this chapter finishes, and last time I read the book for YouTube, it took me much faster, so I think I'll do this again, and I'll try not to add any of my opinions. I might. Probably won't. But we have eight pages left. Uh, so... I'll just start where I left off and then until the end of the chapter. The print in this is fairly small, so it might take me a little longer to read compared to the other one, which had larger print. But uh, yeah, I'll be reading this and once again, very sorry for all the noise in the background. So uh, this is Liberal Fascism by Jonah Goldberg. <laughs> a simple fact remains. Progressives did many things that we would today call objectively fascist, and fascists did many things we would today call objectively progressive, teasing apart this seeming contradiction and showing why it is not in fact a contradiction are major aims of this book. But that does not mean I am calling liberals Nazis. Let me put it this way. No serious person can deny that Marxist ideas had a profound impact on what we call liberalism. To point this out doesn't mean that one is calling, say, Barack Obama a Stalinist or a communist. One can go even further and note that many of the most prominent liberals and leftists of the 20th century assiduously minimized the evils and dangers presented by Soviet communism, but that doesn't necessarily mean it would be fair to accuse them of actually favoring Stalin's genocidal crimes. It's cruel to call someone a Nazi because it unfairly suggests sympathy with the Holocaust. Here I shall interject. Um, <laughs> I think it's a term. I don't really think it's uh, necessarily something that suggests sympathy with the Holocaust. I think that's kind of a dumb thing to say. I think it's used metaphorically, not necessarily literally. So, um... It's like calling someone a feminazi or a gram grammar Nazi. It just shows extremity, not necessarily <laughs> sympathy with the Holocaust. I mean, it can, if you mean it literally, but uh, metaphorically, I see no problem with it. So uh, let me jump back into the text. But it is no less inaccurate to assume that fascism was simply the ide ideology of Jewish genocide. If you need a label for that, call it Hitlerism, for Hitler would not be Hitler without genocidal racism. And while Hitler was a fascist, fascism need not be synonymous with Hitlerism. For example, it's illuminating to note that Jews were overrepresented in the Italian fascist party and remained so from the early 1920s until 1938. Fascist Italy had nothing like a death camp system. Not a single Jew of any national origin under Italian control anywhere in the world was handed over to Germany until 1943 when Italy was invaded by the Nazis. Jews in Italy survived the war at a higher rate than anywhere under Axis rule, save Denmark, and Jews in Italian-controlled areas of Europe fared almost as well. Mussolini actually sent Italian troops into harm's way to save Jewish lives. Francisco Franco, allegedly a quintessential fascist dictator, also refused Hitler's demand to hand over Spanish Jews, saving tens of thousands of Jews from extermination. It was Franco who signed the document abrogating the 1492 Edict of Expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Meanwhile, the supposedly liberal French and Dutch eagerly cooperated with the Nazi deportation program. At this point, I need to make a few statements of a kind that should be obvious, but are necessary in order to prevent any possibility of being misunderstood or having my argument distorted by hostile critics. I love this country and have tremendous faith in its good and decency under no circumstances can I imagine a fascist regime like that of the Nazis coming to power here, let alone an event like the Holocaust. This is because Americans, all Americans, liberals, conservatives, and independents, blacks, whites, Hispanics, and Asians, are shaped by a liberal, democratic, and egalitarian culture, strong enough to resist any such totalitarian temptations. Okay, so 
I'm going to interject again. Uh, let me see when this book was published. Because I think, uh, considering the atmosphere in America now, I would definitely say something else. So this was uh, first published in 2007. Yes, very different environment. I don't think the U.S. was as divided as it is now. I think the way liberals have this type of mindset, and this isn't all of them, of course, but I think these liberals, these radical leftists, these regressive leftists, they have this idea that uh, their way is the right way and the conservatives' way is kind of, you know, traditional and old and it's criticizing, you know, like, in a way that would be uh, offensive or not inclusive, I suppose, or that it doesn't give everyone rights, and they want to act like champions for rights, but they don't try to see it from the other side. Whereas, I mean, I guess I... This is a bit, I mean, of an exaggeration, not quite well, but, you know, I feel like people who are on the right still have more of a consideration for what leftists think. They can understand their mindset better than leftists can understand someone from the right's mindset. So that's how I feel about that. But uh, the environment now when it comes to leftists, I definitely think we can have something fascistic in America. I mean, for sure conservatives are going to fight against that and uh, centrists will probably fight against that. But um, definitely if, if there was some sort of radical leftist turnover, fascism is completely possible in America. Um, and, you know, Americans just, oh, I hate America. I mean, come on, what, 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 why are you saying that? That makes no sense. So when there's such an ha a hatred for your own country, of course you're going to want to change it. And I mean, you know, it's not going to be a, a good change if uh, this sort of fascistic mentality is in place. Uh, now I'm going to go back into the text. So no, I do not think liberals are evil, villainous, or bigoted in the sense that typical Nazi comparisons suggest. The right-wing shtick of calling Hillary Clinton Hitlery is no less sophomoric than the constant drumbeat of Bush Hitler. <laughs> Ooh, nonsense one finds on the left. The Americans who cheered for Mussolini in the 1920s cannot be held to account for what Hitler did nearly two decades later, and liberals today are not responsible for what their intellectual forefathers believed, though they should account for it. But at the same time, Hitler's crimes do not erase the similarities between progressivism, now called liberalism, and the ideologies and attitudes that brought Mussolini and Hitler to power. For example, it has long been known that the Nazis were economic populists, heavily influenced by the same ideas that motivated American and British populists, and while too often downplayed by liberal historians, American populism has a strong anti-Semitic and conspiratorial streak. A typical cartoon in a populist publication depicted the world grasped in the tentacles of an octopus sitting atop the British Isles. The octopus was labeled Rothschild. Um, now I'm going to interject again. I think I have seen this uh, this cartoon before, uh, showing an octopus with its hands in every, you know, uh, British-owned place. I guess it's supposed to represent imperialism. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I've seen it before. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I had to say about that. Um, so let's continue. <laughs> An Associated Press reporter noted of the 1896 Populist Convention, the extraordinary hate of the Jewish race on display. Father Charles Coughlin, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, Charles Coughlin, the radio priest, was a left-wing populist rabble-rouser and conspiracy theorist whose anti-Semitism was well-known among establishment liberals, even when they defended the pro-Roosevelt demagogue as being on the side of the angels. Today, populist conspiracy theories run amok across the left and are hardly unknown on the right. A full third of Americans believe it is very or somewhat likely that the government was behind or allowed the 9-11 attacks. 
I am one of those people. I am just such a conspiracy theorist that uh, almost everything to me is not what it seems. Um, but uh, yeah, I definitely think that was a government insider job. <laughs> Continuing, a particular paranoia about the influence of the Jewish lobby has infected significant swaths of the campus and European left, not to mention the poisonous and truly Hitlerian anti-Semitic populism of the Arab street under regimes most would recognize as fascist. My point isn't that the left is embracing Hitlerite anti-Semitism. Rather, it is embracing populism and indulging anti-Semites to an extent that is alarming and dangerous. Moreover, it's worth recalling that the success of Nazism in uh, Weimar Germany partially stemmed from the unwillingness of decent men to take it seriously. There are other similarities between German and Italian fascist ideas and modern American liberalism. For example, the corporatism at the heart of liberal economics today is seen at it as a bulwark against right-wing and vaguely fascistic corporate ruling classes, and yet the economic ideas of Bill and Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Al Gore, and Robert Reich are deeply similar to the corporatist third-way ideologies that spawned fascist economies, oh, economics in the 1920s and 1930s. Indeed, contemporary liberalism's cargo cult over the New Deal is enough to place modern liberalism in the family tree of fascism. So essentially what this book is trying to show is how uh, fascism and liberalism have strong ties together and how it's just passing over through the generations. Um, basically the epitome of history repeats itself. Continuing with the text. Or consider the explosion of health and new age crusades in recent years, from the war on smoking to the obsession with animal rights to the sanctification of organic foods. No one disputes that these fads are a product of the cultural and political left, and I cannot dispute that either because I live in California, such a very leftist place, and <laughs> I am very much for uh, all three of those except for maybe animal rights, but only to a certain extent. I love zoos, so that's my that's my beef with that. Ha, <laughs> beef. Um, but yeah, everything else on there. I'm very leftist. Like every test I've ever taken that's supposed to show my political leanings always says I'm leftist. Of course, um, it's left, but it's like center left. Like, I'm nearly to the center in almost everyone. I've never gotten <laughs> right-leaning or conservative on my stuff, though. Um, so, to continue, <laughs> but if you are willing to grapple with the fact that we've seen this sort of thing before, Heinrich Himmler was a certified animal rights activist and an aggressive promoter of natural healing. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, championed homeopathy and herbal remedies. Hitler and his advisors dedicated hours of their time to discussions of the need to move the entire nation to vegetarianism as a response to the unhealthiness promoted by capitalism. So if you needed uh, another reason to hate vegetarians, there's one. <laughs> um, I don't know how to pronounce that. Dachau. <laughs> how do I freaking pronounce that? Uh, Dachau hosted the world's largest alternative and organic medicine research lab and produced its own organic honey. In profound ways, the Nazi anti-smoking and public health drives foreshadowed today's crusades against junk food, trans fats, and the like. So, uh, when people want to call Hitler such an evil dude, I mean, he did some pretty good things. I have to admit, that's, that's pretty good. Crusades against junk food, trans fats, and the like. That's very good. Man, you just hear me talking and then you hear stuff in the background. And <laughs> I'm just like, well, what do they think this is? <laughs> um, yeah, very much commotion in here. But, um, yeah, Hitler did nothing wrong, guys, okay? That is why you see me on there always being, like, a freaking neo-Nazi. <laughs> no, uh, just kidding. Let's continue. <laughs> a Hitler Youth Manual proclaimed, Nutrition is not a private matter, a mantra substantially echoed by the public health establishment today. The Nazis' fixation on organic foods... <laughs> California? California has such a fixation on organic foods, too. Wow. California uber allus, guys. Um, okay, continuing. <laughs> the Nazis' fixation on organic foods and personal health neatly fit their larger understanding of how the world works. 
Many Nazis were convinced that Christianity, which held to that men were intended to conquer nature rather than live in harmony with it, and capitalism, which alienated men from their natural state, conspired to undermine German health. In a widely read book on nutrition, Hugo Klein blamed capitalist special interests and masculinized Jewish half-women for the decline in quality of German foods, which contributed in turn to the rise in cancer. And uh, I gotta say, because I'm a conspiracy theorist, I have thought for a while that the stuff in food is what's causing so much of the the disease, like uh, cancer and diabetes and all that other stuff. I think food is largely a factor in that, and you have to consider the difference between food that was eaten in the past and food now. I even think people look much, much more attractive back then compared to now. Uh, I know that's a very subjective thing, but, uh, I mean, to me, I think it's based on what we're eating, and we just don't know it. Of course, that's just me being a conspiracy theorist, but I'm just like, ah, the government, <laughs> the government's putting stuff in our food, like, what? Um, <laughs> I don't know if you heard my mom in the background there, she's just like, you're funny. Like, <laughs> I almost responded, but... I have to keep my cool, okay? How is this ever gonna work out if I can't focus? <laughs> Which I'm not doing because I keep diverting from the text. But, uh, yeah. Conspiracy theorists with food. Um, so to continue. Organic food was inextricably linked to what the Nazis then described as the left does today as social justice issues. Wow, that's sickening. <laughs> okay. Uh, continuing, are you automatically a fascist if you care about health, nutrition, and the environment? Of course not. What is fascist in is the notion that in an organic national community, the individual has no right not to be healthy. Okay, see, I don't agree with that. I love junk food, but I also love health. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you can't force someone to be healthy. That's stupid. Um, so yeah, I'm not a fascist. I'm no fascist. I'm no commie. <laughs> um... Yeah, continuing, and the state therefore has the obligation to force us to be healthy for our own good. Well, uh, if you've ever heard of those uh, metabolo laws in Japan, I think that's pretty cool, but I don't think it forces you to be healthy either, so I think something like that should be uh, put in every country, especially America. But uh, yeah, something like the metabolo laws, where it, which uh, promotes healthy eating but doesn't force you to be healthy, is good. I think that would be very good for all countries. But again, you don't have to force that, and I don't expect people to. Uh, continuing, to the extent that these modern health movements seek to harness the power of the state to their agenda, they flirt with classical fascism. Even culturally, environmentalism gives license to the sort of moral bullying and intrusion that, were it couched in terms of traditional morality, liberals would immediately denounce as fascist. As of this writing, a legislator in New York wants to ban using iPods when crossing the street. In many parts of the country, it is illegal to smoke in your car or even outdoors if other human beings could conceivably be near you. We hear much about how conservatives want to invade our bedrooms, but as this book went to press, Greenpeace and other groups were launching a major campaign to educate people on how they can have environmentally friendly sex. <laughs> what, 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 what is wrong with you, Greenpeace? That doesn't even make sense, but okay. Uh, Greenpeace has a whole list of strategies for getting it on for the good of the planet. <laughs> Ooh, I think that would, uh, turn off a lot of people. <laughs> not, it would not, uh, do what they wanted, it would do the opposite. <laughs> uh, continuing. <laughs> you may trust that environmentalists have no desire to translate these voluntary suggestions into law, but I have no such confidence given the track record of similar campaigns in the past. Free speech, too, is under relentless assault where it matters most around elections, and it is being sanctified where it matters least around strippers' polls and on terrorist websites. In Democracy in America, Alexis de Tocqueville warned, uh, it must not be forgotten that if it is especially dangerous to enslave men in the minor details of life, for my own part I should be inclined to think freedom less necessary in great things than in little ones. And I think I read about him just a few moments ago, because I, I was doing history homework before reading this, because I got bored and, you know, 
wanted to record something for my channel. But uh, when Alexis de Tocqueville, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, when he came to America, he said uh, we were very egalitarian. Maybe I just read that in here just a second ago. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I did read that a second ago in here. But not by Alexis de Tocqueville. But in my book, it also says that, too, that he thought uh, we were very egalitarian. And uh, that was something he liked about America. I'm very sure I cannot find it. I annotated a lot in this in my textbook. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Democracy in America, it's good. We are leading the way for other people. People look up to us, even if they hate us. So, um, to continue, this country seems to have inverted Tocqueville's hierarchy. We must all lose our liberties on the littlest things so that a handful of people can enjoy their freedoms to the fullest. And we see that now with uh, people trying to say stuff is offensive we have to stop saying it because oh no someone could get triggered um things like the transgender bathroom laws i mean that's only going to protect like such a small portion of the uh, population here and lots of other things so it's like uh do we care more about the minority or the majority and it's like you know yeah i understand it you care about these minority rights but how many people does it affect how much of an effect is it really going to have? Do these people care that much? Is their life going to be drastically changed positively by these laws or acts or anything? Is it really going to change them? Is it really going to affect them in such a way that it's like, oh yeah, we just made a change for America. We just helped so many people, even if they're not a part of this. I mean, it helped impact the world. I mean, does it really do that? Because sometimes I don't, I don't really think it does. And so we're trying to protect a, such a small percentage of people rather than telling them to suck it up when it comes to terms that are considered offensive or other things that it's like, dude, I mean, come on, you should be able to adapt. So uh, that's how I, how I view that. I mean, there are definitely times when the minority is important, but not when it's sacrificing the rights of other people in this country. It's like you're getting rid of one group's rights just to please this one, please this group's rights, that's not necessarily fair. So, uh, to continue, for generations, our primary vision of a dystopian future has been that of Orwell's 1984. This was a fundamentally masculine nightmare of fascist brutality. But with the demise of the Soviet Union and the vanishing memory of the great 20th century fascist and communist dictatorships, the nightmare vision of 1984 is slowly fading away. In its place, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World is emerging as the more prophetic book as we unravel the human genome and master the ability to make people happy with televised entertainment and psychoactive drugs. Politics is increasingly a vehicle for delivering prepackaged joy. America's political system used to be about the pursuit of happiness. Now, more and more of us want to stop chasing it and have it delivered. And though it has been the subject of high school English essay questions for generations we have not gotten much closer to answering the question what exactly was so bad about the brave new world simply this it is fool's gold the idea that we can create a heaven on earth through pharmacology and neuroscience is as utopian as the marxist hope that we could create a perfect world by rearranging the means of production we also learned recently in my history class about uh, utopias of the 1800s when the reform movement and transcendentalism were a big thing in America. Every utopia failed. Every utopia failed. They were highly communal, which means they wanted to share things. Uh, because, you know, in a perfect society, you're obviously going to be sharing because sharing is caring. But um, no, none of them ever worked and they all diminished soon after, even if they had these perfect ideals based on what they thought was morally right or virtuous, it never worked out for them. And if you try to create a world like that now, it's just going to fall down. Like it's trying, it's going to happen like that again. And I think some of the division in America can showcase that. I think when liberals try to make their perfect world with uh, no offensive, no, nothing offensive or everything that would protect 
everyone, even though it doesn't protect everyone. You know, their their vision of a perfect world, it's going to also bring down America. I see this as the fall of Western civilization. And uh, it's happening right now. So, to continue, the history of totalitarianism is the history of the quest to transcend the human condition and create a society where our deepest meaning and destiny are realized simply by virtue of the fact that we live in it. It cannot be done, and even if, as often in the case of liberal fascism, the effort is very careful to be humane and decent, it will still result in a kind of benign tyranny, where some people get to impose their ideas of goodness and happiness on those who may not share them. And that's the, that's the, that's the problem. It's not democratic at all. It is not democratic at all. And um, I guess I would say it's like an uh, animal farm. Some... Uh, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal. So everyone's equal, but uh, more some someone else's ideals of happiness and goodness are more equal. So theirs are what's going to rule, and yours are the ones that aren't. And you just have to go with it because perfect society, right? You don't have any say in that because you're breaking the perfection of this society. And uh, that's not right. It's not democratic. Okay, to continue. <laughs> the introduction of a novel term like liberal fascism obviously requires an explanation. Many critics will undoubtedly regard it as a crass oxymoron. Actually, however, I am not the first to use the term. That honor falls to H.G. Wells, one of the greatest influences on the progressive mind in the 20th century, and, it turns out, the inspiration for Huxley's Brave New World. Nor did Wells coin the phrase as an indictment, but as a badge of honor. Progressives must become liberal fascists and enlightened Nazis, he told the young liberals at Oxford in a speech in July 1932. Wells was a leading voice in what I have called the fascist moment, when many Western elites were eager to replace church and crown with slide rules and industrial armies. Throughout his work, he championed the idea that special men, variously identified as scientists, priests, warriors or samurai must impose progress on the masses in order to create a new republic or a world theocracy only through militant progressivism by whatever name could mankind achieve the fulfillment of the kingdom of god well simply put was enthralled by the totalitarian temptation i have never been able to escape altogether from its relentless logic he declared Fascism, like progressivism and communism, is expansionist because it sees no natural boundary to its ambitions. For violent variants, like so-called Islamo-fascism, this is transparently obvious. But progressivism, too, envisions a new world order. World War I was a crusade to redeem the whole world, according to Woodrow Wilson. Even Wilson's pacifist Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, could not shake off his vision of a Christian world order, complete with a global prohibition of alcohol. One objection to all of this might be, so what? It's interesting, in a counterintuitive way, to learn that a bunch of dead liberals and progressives thought this or that, but what does it have to do with liberals today? Two responses come to mind. The first is, admittedly, not fully responsive. Conservatives in America must carry their intellectual history, real and alleged, around their necks like an albatross. The ranks of elite liberal journalism and scholarship swell with intrepid scribblers who point to hidden histories and disturbing echoes in the conservative historical closet. Connections with dead right-wingers, no matter how tenuous and obscure, are trotted out as proof that today's conservatives are continuing a nefarious project. Why, then, is it so trivial to point out that the liberal closet has its own skeletons, particularly when those skeletons are the architects of the modern welfare state? Which raises the second response. Liberalism, unlike conservatives, conservatism, is operationally uninterested in its own intellectual history, but that doesn't make it any less indebted to it. Liberalism stands on the shoulders of its own giants and thinks its feet are planted firmly on the ground. Its assumptions and aspirations can be traced straight back to the progressive era, a fact illustrated by the liberal tendency to use the word progressive whenever talking about its core convictions and idea-generating institutions. The Progressive Magazine, the Progressive Policy Institute, the Center for American Progress, and so on. I am simply fighting on a battleground of liberalism's choosing. Liberals are the ones who've invested that conservatism has connections with fascism. They are the ones who claim free market economics are fascist, and that therefore their own economic theories should be seen as the more virtuous, even though the truth is almost entirely the reverse. 
And I think we can see this often um, with, you know, regressive leftists. They just do not want to own up to the fact that their side also has bad things. Like, you mean, I mean, as a conservative, I can obviously say that there are bad things within our, within our side. But these liberals, it's like, why don't you own up to it either? So I think that's what uh, this guy is trying to point out. And, yeah, you know, if you're going to be a liberal, like, I have a, a friend, he's a liberal, and he's always able to call it out when he sees something wrong within liberals. So it's like, why can't you all be like that? Because it's the ones that are the most outspoken that, you, you know, you just, you don't see any compliance to admit these kinds of things. <laughs> Continuing. Today's liberalism doesn't seek to conquer the world by force of arms. It is not a nationalist and genocidal project. To the contrary, it is an ideology of good intentions. But we all know where even the best of intentions can take us. I have not written a book about how all liberals are Nazis or fascists. Rather, I have tried to write a book warning that even the best of us are susceptible to the totalitarian temptation. This includes some self-described conservatives. Compassionate conservatism, in many respects, is a form of progressivism. A descendant of of Christian socialism. Much of George W. Bush's rhetoric about leaving no children behind and how when somebody hurts, government has got to move, bespeaks a vision of the state that is indeed totalitarian in its aspirations and not particularly conservative in the American sense. Once again, it is a nice totalitarianism motivated no doubt by sincere Christian love, thankfully tempered by poor implementation, but love too can be smothering. In fact, the rage that Bush's tenure has elicited in many of his critics is illustrative. Bush's intentions are decent, but those who don't share his vision find them oppressive. The same works the other way around. Liberals agree with Hillary Clinton's intentions. They just assert that anyone who finds them oppressive is a fascist. And, um, you know, that's not, that's not warranted at all. Like, I mean, I'm not gonna agree with liberals on everything. I definitely don't really. I mean, I do, but it's like, you know, when I don't agree with them, I'm not gonna say that it's a fascist thing. Like, when they're trying to make hate speech laws, yes, that's fascist, because we have the First Amendment here, which protects our right to say whatever we want. So when you try to limit speech, yes, that's definitely a fascist thing. But if you're doing something else that I just don't agree with, like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's bad. <laughs> I can't even explain something. Um, I don't, I don't freaking know, like, what, what, like, you know, anti-death penalty stuff, which, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say that since I agree with it. But if you say something like that, I'm not going to say it's fascist just because you're a liberal. That makes no sense. And uh, liberals shouldn't be doing that cons to conservatives either. But, you know, we're the, we're the racist, sexist, xenophobic party, aren't we? Um, yeah, we're, we're obviously fascist, oppressive fascists. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, it's, you're not a fascist just because someone, do someone doesn't agree with you like just because I don't agree with you doesn't mean you're a fascist and just because my ideas don't uh, correlate with yours doesn't make me a fascist okay so continuing finally since we must have a working definition of fascism here is mine fascism is a religion of the state it assumes the organic unity of the body politic and longs for a national leader attuned to the will of the people. It is totalitarian in that it views everything as political and holds that any action by the state is justified to achieve the common good. So when we learned about fascism and totalitarianism in uh, my history class, my teacher said they were both basically the same, except fascism was uh, right-wing and totalitarianism was left-wing. I wouldn't even distinguish it like that. Again, like, you know, these fascists that he's listing in here, like uh, Hitler. Hitler is obviously not a right-winger. He's a left-winger. We know that because he's a socialist. So, I mean, he's a fascist and he's a socialist. So I think it's just a term. I think they're both the same thing, basically. But, you know, if you want to switch it up and expand that vocabulary, then you can use either one. I think they're interchangeable. That's what I would uh, say. So, yeah, continuing. It takes responsibility for all aspects of life, including our health and well-being. 
and seeks to impose uniformity of thought and action, whether by force or through regulation and social pressure. And uh, yeah, actually, that is another aspect of fa uh, fascism that I see. I think fascism is conformity. So when someone wants everyone to share this, this cult-like hive mind, that's totally fascist. And to continue with the text, um, everything, including the economy and religion, must be aligned with its, its objectives. Any rival identity is part of the problem, and therefore defined as the enemy. Again, fascist, because they don't want you to have a different mindset. So when everyone has this sort of uh, agreed-upon opinion, you know, majority rules, when there's a dissenting opinion, um, you know, a rebellion of some sort, it's automatically seen as uh, fascist when it's not the fascist thing. You're the fascist one for thinking someone can't have a different opinion. So that's uh, definitely how it's how it is. Uh, <laughs> man, I'm really bad at explaining things today. I always am, to be honest. <laughs> to continue, I will argue that contemporary American liberalism embodies all of these aspects of fascism, and I will argue the same. <laughs> So, before we conclude, some housekeeping issues. I will follow the standard practice among English-speaking historians of fascism. When referring to generic fascism, I will spell the word with a lowercase f. I guess this is not really important for you guys to know. Um, but I guess, I guess it's important for me to know, and since I'll keep reading it to you, maybe it is important for you to know. So, we'll just keep reading this because whatever... Uh, when referring to Italian fascism, I will use the uppercase. Uh, I have also tried to be clear when I am talking about liberalism as we use the phrase today and classical liberals liberalism, which means more or less the exact opposite, which is true. So this guy just wants to make sure he distinguishes each one. Uh, fascism is an enormous topic with thousands of books covering relevant themes. I've tried to be fair to the academic literature, though this is not an academic book. Indeed, the literature is so fraught with controversy that not only is there no accepted definition of fascism, but there isn't even a consensus that Italian fascism and Nazism were kindred phenomena. I have tried to steer clear of such debates whenever possible, but my own view is that despite the profound doctrinal differences between Italian and German fascism, they represented kindred sociological phenomena. And that's basically the fact that so many people were uh, keen on fascism. Uh, and you can even take tests online that will show you if somebody were to uh, if somebody were to present this sort of uh, fascist uh, personality, I suppose, like they were going to rule in a fascistic way, that if they were to uh, present themselves to you that you would actually take their side and it's just this whole psychological thing where people are prone to it and they find some sort of comfort in it um, to continue I have also tried to steer clear of the scores of others other fascisms around the globe critics may claim that this is to my advantage in that this or that fascism was clearly right-wing or conservative or unprogressive I'll take such criticisms on a case-by-case -case basis but I should also note that this practice hurts my case as much as it helps for example by excluding Oswald Mosley's British Union of fascists I have cut myself off from a wonderful supply of left-wing pro-fascist rhetoric and arguments I've tried not to clutter the book with citations, but I have included quite a few explanatory or discursive uh, or discursive notes. Readers curious about other sources and further reading should consult the website for this book, www.liberalfascism.com, and may also post comments or queries there. I will do my best to engage as many good faith correspondents as possible. And that is the end, so... Uh, yeah, you should comment if you liked how I did this one. In the last one, I just read straight through it, and then I added my comments at the end. But, uh, I mean, for this type of book, I don't think I can really do that, because those things are going to come to my mind, and I'm not going to hold them in there for the whole time while I'm reading, because it's going to re be replaced with some other idea. So, I mean, I kind of, I quite like this format. I, I don't think it will uh, deter from how long it takes me. It just depends on how many pages I'm reading and how interested I am in the topic uh, or whatever he's arguing. But, uh, yeah, if you like this format better, please comment. And if you like what I'm reading or if you have another suggestion of what I should read, I'm only reading nonfiction right now. I'm going to be only reading nonfiction because I'm done with fiction 
I'm so sick of it. So if you have any other um, suggestions, you can leave those in the comment box too. Uh, thanks for listening and bye.